a couple years ago, we hit million dollar net worth recently at $2 million net worth and we have enough cash flow to pay for our lives. And so because of that, I was able to leave my nine to five. You know that you're going to change the real estate one way or another. You're going to put new tenants in there. You're going to renovate it. You're going to paint it. You're going to do some new landscaping, but you don't know how much real estate is going to change you until you get into it. Your podcast, Twitter, how those things have helped you in your real estate journey and what your plans are for them going forward. So I started the Adulting is Easy podcast as a way to sort of talk to my sister about personal finance. But then she got busy, you know, with SATs and applying for colleges and things like that. And it worked out because she got into Florida, but she didn't have the time for the actual podcast. Our our conversations are mostly off mic now. So I switched to interviewing personal finance experts. Our main offering and what we want to do is launch first generation real estate investors. So people who... Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Lauren Keen Almond on the show. She is a podcast host, real estate investor, and the co-founder of House Money Media. Lauren, thank you for coming on the show. Andres, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Something I always forget, so I got to do it now. Please, if you're listening, like, subscribe, comment, give us some love. It really helps us grow, and we love to hear kind of feedback from all of you. So Lauren, I like to just let the get the ball rolling right off the bat. Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and, and a little bit about your journey and we'll start there. Absolutely. So I am Lauren is my name. Like you said, I am at adulting is easy on Twitter, by the way. So some people know me as adulting is easy more than Lauren. Um, I am 33 years old. I am married to my husband. He's 30 and we are real estate investors based in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. Both of us are born and raised and we are fi- financially independent through real estate. So about a couple years ago, ago, we hit million dollar net worth. Uh, recently at $2 million net worth and we have enough cash flow to pay for our lives. And so because of that, I was able to leave my nine to five and my husband's uh, thinking about his transition plan in the future. And so that's kind of what we've got going on in our lives right now. (laughs) That's awesome. And I'm not too far from you. I'm Miami native, born and raised. I absolutely love Tampa and Tampa Bay area is amazing. So I love that. And I love that you were able to kind of just go in and, and, and leave that nine to five. I know that's a very common theme. I've had a lot of people on the show who are also on that journey, some who have already accomplished it, some who are trying to accomplish it. Talk about that transition. Like, What was it like to go away from having that stable income that you regularly had to going out and taking a little bit of a risk um, and then betting on yourself? Yeah, having the stable paycheck has been huge. I got into sales when I was like 24 years old. I think that was the first time I made six figures. And so that makes it even somewhat harder to walk away because it's a pretty good chunk of money. And then uh, you know, I married my husband husband and he joined me in six figure land not too far after that. And I say all this not to say like, I'm like, oh, I'm a six figure earner, like brag about it. I'm just saying like the reality is when most people are making that much money, they're spending pretty close to it, which makes it even harder to replace that income. So I went I went down that path a little bit. I uh, when I bought my second house, I did keep my first one, which was good. Um, but like I bought the BMW, we moved into the golf course community. This is before we were married. But like, basically, I bought us our first two houses. I was like, we're good. Like we're making good money. We were maxing out our 401ks and our Roths. And I was like, oh, we must be able to retire early. And that wasn't true. And so like we could retire not early. Like, it was like 55 or something. And I was like, well, that's not like that early. I don't know if I want to do this for the next 20, 30 years. And so that's when we took the steps to replacing the income. And so we, I sold that first house, bought a duplex with it, later on traded that duplex up in a 1031 exchange to a six unit apartment building and have bought three other properties along the way. So we now have four properties properties that add up to 11 short-term rentals and three long-term rentals. And we knew that, especially if we house hacked, which is buy a property, live in one unit, rent out the other units, or even bedrooms, for example, I knew that if we did that, we could decrease that timeline significantly. And then we just kind of snowballed from there into these other things. But at first it was just meant to speed up retirement a a little bit. And then now it it really became a big goal, a big push in the last three years. So in 2019, if you would have looked at our spreadsheet, would have said retiring at 55. And now in 2023, I did it at 33. And my husband's not far behind me. I'm trying to get him to work till 33 because that seems fair since he's 30. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I love that. And then and there's a lot of similarities to that to actually my life right now. I'm 24. Um, just started my career in tech sales at a great company. My girlfriend, my significant other has also just started her career in sales at a tech company. And we are making a good amount of money between the both of us. So it's like, how can we really get ahead? And finance is something I've always been very conscious of, like always educated myself on that. We both max out our 401ks. Like you said, we both invest. We both have a great savings plan. We're fortunate now that we still both live at home and are utilizing the keep your expenses as low as possible and make as much money method. And I, I like to do the 40, 40, 20, which is something I've talked about. Invest 40, save 40 and spend the other 20 on, on things you want and things you want to do. Um, yep. So it's awesome to hear that. And I've said this on a ton of other episodes and it's kind of a reason why I started the podcast. I get to interview amazing people like yourself and learn more. It's a little bit selfish, honestly. Like I'm in this position. I want to learn from you. So let's talk about that first do and kind of build off that. How was that experience? How did you decide that was the property you were looking for? Give us a little bit of insight on that. Yeah, absolutely. And congrats to you and your girlfriend. That's awesome. Yeah, once you can save 50 percent of what you're making, that's I think that's really the tipping point where things get a lot easier. And then last year, our real estate was paying all of our bills. So we had in some ways like a 100 percent savings rate last year. That's amazing. Yeah, that really, really propelled things. But it does take a little while. Um, I bought my first house. I went under contract at 20 closed at 23. And when I was 27, I bought my next primary and kept that first house and started looking for another one like, you know, with basically like, you know, how sales is, or at least how it was for me I got a lot of my commissions and bonuses at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And so I would end up with kind of this chunk of cash. And it didn't really cross my mind for some reason to put it in a brokerage account. It was like, well, this is for more real estate. And I started making offers on duplexes like in in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I was just getting turned down left and right because I I needed financing. And so I was like, well, what? how can I get a duplex? How can I go from one door to two doors? This was my goal. And I was I was cash flowing probably like 500 bucks a month. I was like, I can cash for like $1,000 a month if I pay cash for a duplex and I can have two doors instead of one. And so I sold the first one. I lived there two out of the last five years. So there were no capital gains taxes on it. And I paid cash for this duplex. Amazing. And like it was in a terrible area, unfortunately. And then we went through like COVID and like they, you know, the one side stopped paying rent and then like there was a squatter and then I couldn't get the squatter out. And then it was like a whole thing. And so I only held on to that duplex for about two years, but it did appreciate somehow a hundred thousand hmm. dollars. So I went wow. from one, one actually I bought it for 170, I think 170. I sold it for 285 two years later, and we did the 1031 exchange into a six unit apartment building that cash flows, you know, about fifty thousand dollars a year. So because it's we do short term rentals there. So, you know, really that's you know, and that's how you can real estate doesn't have to be this preordained thing. You don't have to get into real estate investing knowing exactly where you're going to go. You can sort of figure it out along the way and decide, all right, do I want to be the single family home person? Eh, no. Do I want to be the long-term rental duplex in a D neighborhood person? No. Do I want to buy a bed and breakfast, live a part of it, rent out some accessory dwelling units on Airbnb? Yes. Okay. I like doing short-term rentals. All right. Now what can I do with this long-term duplex to get me into the short-term rental game? Oh, the six unit is for sale. I'm going to buy that and I'm going to short-term rent four of those, long-term rent two of them. So you, it's a journey. It's a journey of trading up. It's a journey of figuring out what you like, what you're good at and what lights you up. And and for me, that does happen to be short term rentals. It also is, you know, much, much more lucrative than long term rentals. But I also just yep. I have a lot more fun with it. And I'm a lot better at it. <laughs> so two things I want to touch on there. One, um, just for people listening that maybe want to get more educated on real estate or are just completely uneducated, maybe explain a 1031 exchange for people listening. And then also after that, I'd love to talk about the the squatter. People don't love to talk about the tough times, but I think that's really good for people listening who want to learn a little bit of the both sides of the equation because everybody loves to talk about the great cash flow, but not everybody shares kind of those tough times in real estate. So what's a 1031? And then maybe talk a little bit about that squatter situation. Absolutely. So and just a side note, if everybody wants to learn about real estate investing, follow me on Adulting is Easy on Twitter. Um, I also have a podcast called Adulting is Easy. It's personal finance with a lot of real estate. And I've also just now launched a new podcast with some business partners, the Frugal Gay, Tom Brickman, and real estate maximalist, Alan Corey. And we're launching House Money Media, which is going to be a real estate education and content creation company. So side that. plug for me. But if you do yeah. want to know more about this stuff, you know, 1031 exchanges, for example, you know, how to run a short term rental, how to deal with squatters, things like that, you know, we're going to be covering all of that. So side note, so 1031 exchange, it's we love to do this 401k is the same way in this country, we like to name things 
after the tax code and the section of the tax code that is it. So 1031 is some number in there. And what it means is when you sell a place, you could normally, you would take the money out of it, right? Like my example, paid $175,000, sold the, or 170, sold this place for 285. You would take that, say, 100 grand. I'm ignoring, you know, some of the transaction fees. <laughs> Do you take that 100 grand and then you pay taxes on the difference, right? So I made 100 grand. I pay 15%, say, in capital gains to the government. And then I have $85,000 to go put in something else, right? Plus the money I got back because mm. I paid cash, but whatever. So that's the point. So I, instead of doing that, took that money. It immediately went to a qualified intermediary. I never possessed the money from that sale. And then I bought a six unit apartment building and that qualified intermediary sent that money to them for that closing. And in doing that, you also have to file some paperwork with the government and things like that. But in doing that, I don't pay that, say, $15,000 in taxes now. And some people mm-hmm. are like, that's stupid. Just pay it. Why do this whole complicated thing? But I knew I was selling and buying at the same time. I and yep. I sort of, I'm the kind of person, I do this all the time and yeah, I don't know, it might get me in trouble someday, but I'll do something just to, just to learn how to do it, just to see what yeah. it's like. And I had That's heard awesome. about 1031 exchanges and I'm like, I'm selling and buying. So I'll do that. So I'll let you react to that and then we can get into the squatter if you want. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. And I personally have done my homework on that. So I loved when, when you brought it up because I think that's something extremely important. And for some people that are like, oh, it's just 15,000. Wait till you get to the bigger priced homes and those 1031s become a lot more money that you're saving in these transactions. And you should always try and maximize um, the amount of money you're putting in and out. I mean, this is your investment, like your money. 15,000 is a lot of money. So for anybody thinking about selling their current home and flipping into another one, 1031 is something you should 100% do homework on. And then make sure to follow the all of the areas Lauren is going to be educating on. And I'll have all that stuff linked below the video as well. But I think that was a perfect description. And I hope anybody listening is, is taking some notes because it's extremely beneficial. Yeah. So those are two things I've done. One is I sold a primary that I lived in two out of five years. And you can do, you can like buy a rental property, I think, rent it out for three years, then live in it for two years, then sell it and have no capital gains taxes. So you wouldn't really need a 1031, something like that. I don't know if you could even, but those, you know, those investment properties. So I've done that a couple of times. Basically, I was supposed to pay the government $15,000 and I kept it. So I sort of am borrowing this $15,000 from this government and I used it to put money into the six unit apartment building. So to the squatter. So I bought a duplex in really like a D area. I think at the time I kind of had convinced myself it was a C area, but it, I mean, there was a murder on that block while I was under contract and there was a murder the following year. So I owned it for two mm. years. There were two murders on the block, like not in the neighborhood, same block. Yeah. And so, you know, but I really wanted to get more cash flow. I wanted, I was like, well, I'll be safer if I own it outright, then I don't have a mortgage payment and I'll have more cash flow. And, you know, I think differently about things now, but at the time that was what I wanted to do. I also wanted to be very hands off. So I had a property manager. So I was like, it's fine if it's in this D area, someone else is going to be going there and handling it. Obviously, I don't think anybody really foresaw this global pandemic slash eviction moratorium. And yeah. so basically, as soon as most people live paycheck to paycheck, I think it's something like 40% of the United States. Um, certainly in D areas, it's going to be probably all of your tenants. And so our uh, as soon as everything shut down for COVID, our tenant lost his income. He was around 65. Uh, we did not know, but he had moved a 26 year old in. And they, so he lost his income, wasn't able to pay April rent. On April like 4th, 2020, there was some sort of domestic dispute. Uh, knowing how this woman is now, I think she may have even initiated it or certainly whenever this domestic happened, she came out on the on the good side of it. So she calls the cops on him. He gets taken. She gets his place, has no lease, wow. writes, writes that down as her address on the police report, changes the locks, never speaks to me. So, and then wow. no lawyer would take this case because it's actually not an eviction. It's some kind of other thing because there was no lease. So it was, it, I couldn't get a lawyer to take it. So the bright side of it was she ended up not, well, basically her, the utilities got shut off. She broke the meters, started stealing the utilities, and then they got shut off again. And that makes it kind of basically uninhabitable. This is like June in Florida. It's, you know, yeah. terrible. And she um, basically at that point abandoned the property when she wasn't there for, I think it's 15 days or whatever the rule is. We were able to gain entry back into the place, packed all of her stuff up, rented a storage unit, put the stuff in the storage unit for her to go get, told her where it was because she wouldn't call me back, but she called me immediately once her stuff was out of there. Well, she actually broke a window and broke back in that night. But anyway, so we changed the locks, wow. finally got her out 
out of there. It ended up costing us, oh, I, I don't remember the exact number. Maybe I've blocked it up. Something like five to $10,000 in between the lost rent and the damage that she did. Um, and then also, you know, having to pay for the storage unit and the movers and the deep clean of the place because there was no plumbing, but she was still hmm. going to the bathroom. So, you know, there was a pretty serious clean that needed to be done. While that was going on, we had bought a bed and breakfast and we're renovating it completely too. So that was a really stressful time. At the time I was 30, my husband was 27. We had just gotten married. There was a global pandemic. I had just changed jobs. And I sort of, I say this a lot, but you know that you're going to change the real estate one way or another. You're going to put new tenants in there. You're going to renovate it. You're going to paint it. You're going to do some new landscaping, but you don't know how much real estate is going to change you until you get into it. And I knew from then on that if I could handle all of that at the same time, there wasn't going to be much that real estate was going to throw at me. So I became really very confident and really then started that flywheel spinning, adding units, launching them and, you know, became financially independent pretty quickly after this. And I don't know how much confidence I would have had had I not gone through those trials and tribulations of that squatter. Yeah, I love how you even during the what you could say is the roughest time in the real estate journey, you were still confident to make other moves and continue to grow and, and learn from that situation, which is extremely unfortunate. But it's surprisingly not uncommon um, when you're in these D areas. I've heard it from other people. And I think just the laws are a little wacky and need to be kind of relooked at. But I'm happy that you were able to move past that and kind of go into the bed and breakfast. I know earlier you said short term rentals were what you're really passionate about and what you really enjoy. I'm guessing that bed and breakfast was the first step into that short term rental journey. How was that? Let's kind of look towards the positive now. It, that was the first step. As I mentioned, when I ran the numbers around 2019, when we got married and I realized we couldn't really retire until we were 55, even with six figure salaries, saving, say, 25 percent and not really living above our means, living really within our means. That's when I knew something had to change. And the most obvious answer, remember, I already had one rental property at this time. I had the I had, I think, the duplex. If not, I, I at least had the first primary and I ran the numbers and I was like, OK, the biggest bill that we have is our mortgage payment. It was twenty five thousand dollars a year, but it's mortgage taxes, insurance, flood insurance, which means, it, you know, you pay taxes and then you pay the twenty five thousand dollars. So you have to earn. I was like thirty thousand dollars of what we earn for like ever. Well, like like at least for 30 years till we pay it off. But even then you still have the taxes and insurance and flood insurance. That's our biggest bill. It's like we got to get rid of this. And that's when I really started thinking more about house hacking. And what I originally wanted was a house with like an above garage apartment. And I was just going to long term rent the above garage apartment. So I thought, OK, my current payment was like twenty two hundred dollars or something like that. I was like, is that it up? That would be twenty five thousand, maybe like two thousand. Let's say it's two thousand dollars. And I was like, maybe we'll get somebody that can pay twelve hundred. I was like, at least we'll cut it down a little bit. It was a really modest goal, but that was the plan. Sort of like a buy one, get one half off rental property. And I sat my husband down at breakfast. I was like, hey, what do you think about that? And he's like, absolutely not. We've only been here three years. We can't move. I was like, but listen, listen what if we get rid of all, you know, some or all of our mortgage payment? What if we buy somewhere where we can bike on a trail every day, walk to restaurants, walk to bars? I'm not saying we have to move, but let's at least explore it. And at that about a, at the end of about a 15 minute conversation, he was sold. And so we started looking and we settled on what was, I mean, I call it a better breakfast because it was, it was a functioning commercial bed and breakfast at the time. It had a house, two accessory dwelling units, which are like little, they're called ADUs, these little separate freestanding cottages is what I call them, and a mobile home. And this, you're like, wow, Lauren, that sounds like a huge property. No, it's downtown, really small lot. I don't know. It's all jam packed in there. But so wow. we bought that and it needed a ton of renovation, but, and we can talk about the renovation or not. That took about six months. But once that was done, we were living in the main house. The two back units were, were rented. We switched out the mobile home for a camper that was rented on Airbnb, but that really just kind of pays for itself or whatever. So we literally, instead of doing what I originally sought out to do, which was get rid of some of the mortgage payment, I ended up buying a bed and breakfast. So I was like, oh, I guess I'll just do Airbnbs. I'll do short term rentals because that's what's already happening here. I'm in this little touristy town. And so it we didn't really set out at all to do short term rentals. We set out to house hack and the property that we found lended itself to short term rentals. And so that's how we ended up in this game. And we had we had done it. We had we'd killed the bill. I mean, that twenty five thousand dollars was gone just like that. It's amazing. I was good there. My husband's like, hey, <laughs> let's cash out refi and buy some more. And so that kind of started us down the path that we're on now. Yeah. And you mentioned the renovations again for people listening. When you're investing in real estate, sometimes the best investment is something that needs a little work that you can go get for a good deal and put some time into. Maybe shed some light on how that process went. What are some do's and don'ts when you're doing renovations um, just from your personal experience? Well, the number one thing with renovations is you're going to have access to a property that's not going to have as much competition as one that's done. So if you're able to look at a property, it's like the 
diamond in the rough thing from Aladdin. Mm. You can cut that out. Probably Disney won't let that stay in here. But <laughs> this idea that if you can see value in a property that other people aren't seeing, it's automatically not going to be as competitive of a situation. And this property had been sitting for six months. It was oddly listed. It was listed as six bedrooms, which meant that it was counting the two cottages and the mobile home. And it was listed without an address. It was listed kind of on the income section versus the traditional residential section of the MLS. It was listed kind of weird. So it, it had been listed for six months. And, you know, I think part of the reason we got it was, well, A, we were young and had, you know, no idea how crazy it was. But the <laughs> other side of it was, I think a lot of people just weren't interested in in doing the amount of work that it needed. She also had it priced kind of high. I think it was like around 350 at the time through the inspections, different negotiations, the COVID shutdowns, which were really bad for bed and breakfast, as you can imagine. We ended up getting it for 285 with 5,000 right. closing cost assistance. So I think also some people didn't think they would be able to get it for the price that we got it. Uh, but the number one thing with, with the renovations is assume there's some crap there you don't know about. And hmm. we basically, we made some assumptions for uh, what was going to happen with the property in terms of, you know, percentage wise, how much more was it going to need? Or were there some decisions that we were going to make along the way? You know, we ended up, uh, you know, changing out of vanity, doing some floors we weren't planning on doing, re uh, taking out a slider and putting in a regular swinging door. Some, you know, we just sort of, some of it was a little bit of unexpected things. Like we found a leak, but some of it was we just chose to make some different decisions. It's like, while we're here, why don't we just do a little more? Yep. Uh, so that that's that's really the number one thing. But that took about six months. So we bought it in June and luckily peak season for Florida starts in January. And so we were done by then. So we lived in the, the little cottages while the main house is being done. And that was roof, structure replacement, kitchen, master bathroom, floors, new deck, total yard remodel, including a new fence, new flooring in the in one of the cottages and a total remodel of one of the other cottages. And so that was about $175,000 in six months and we got the 175 wow. through um my savings and the equity in the house that i sold awesome i mean that's amazing and i love how you guys like completely redid the place i'm sure it looks amazing was your husband i know you had to convince him a little bit was he also passionate about real estate like you were right off the bat or did you have to convince him to do that as well and then when you started seeing the results everybody was like all right we need to keep doing this so my husband's mom has like two rental his grandparents had one at the time. They've, they've since sold it. So the idea that real estate is, as an investment wasn't this foreign idea to him. Mm -hmm. He went along with it. He wasn't passionate about it, but he, I mean, he's an engineer. He understands numbers. So when I tell him, you know, here's what we're spending on this and we can be spending zero and we can take that money and do more with it. You know, he understood and, and he came a long, long way since then. <laughs> Now he's way more into it. Like he dragged me into our our fourth property, this this most recent duplex, and he and he was the one. Like I said, after we did the reno on the bed and breakfast, which does look amazing, we did a cash out refi. So like I said, we put about one hundred seventy five in. We got a hundred and a hundred out, and that we actually were able to drop our interest rate to two point nine nine, which was awesome. Wow, this is, that's this amazing. Was a good old day two years ago or whatever. And we took that $100,000, which we wouldn't have had if he not encouraged me to do that cash out refi and bought a really nicely cash flowing duplex on the water a little bit north of Tampa Bay that has a 3.25% interest rate. Wow. Yeah. And then he also found the six unit apartment building. So I kind of started it, but my, all I wanted to do was house hack and get rid of our mortgage. He then started seeing like, no, like let's take this further and let's try to reach financial independence through it. And I, and I was already familiar with the, you know, fin financial dependence, retire early movement through, you know, through different things that I had been researching when I first became a landlord. And I was like, okay, I guess, you know, hey, we can do it. And that's something I wasn't really thinking too much about, you know, before we got married. It was really after we got married where we could start kind of um, acting more as a team and making joint financial decisions. And I mean, that's your number one person. I mean, on your real estate team and just obviously in life, they have to be on board in some capacity. They don't have to be as yep. passionate about you, but they have to understand your why and your passion for it. And, and you know, you can do you can do great things together. A hundred percent. Hearing those mortgage rates gets me extremely jealous just because and I think this is good for anybody around any of the younger audience. Like I'm 24. Like I said earlier, me and my significant other are making a good income. It's hard to go out and buy a house, especially unfortunately when you live in Miami, these high interest rates and, and all these things. And I've had like a very unique experience. I, I understand real estate. I'm 100% going to be a real estate investor for the remainder of my life just because I do see the value and have friends and family members who have reaped the benefits from it. But I guess I had an unfortunate experience 
experience on my first try. Me and my best friend, we had started our LLC. We're like, we're going to go buy a college apartment um, because that's going to be the easiest to rent. And we drove up to Gainesville. We found the apartment we wanted. We negotiated the price. We were going to pay 71000 It was going to be a 2-2 right by the hospital. They had more of the grad students that rented there. And then we realized when the inspection came that they marked the AC as 2018, but it was really 2008. And we we're like, okay, that's a little odd. Like, that's a significant difference. And then when we got the AC inspected, they're like, oh, yeah, this is like pretty close to end of life. So we we're like, okay, that's fine. But our first experience, we were like, whoa, this thing's like four grand to fix. Like, on a $71,000 house, adding another four grand is a lot. What if it breaks right after we buy it? So then we kind of nickeled and dimed a little bit, which what I would say was our major mistake. And then we didn't want to go through with the renovations because she didn't want to use a contractor. And then our real estate agent was like, all right, this is getting a little weird. Maybe we back off. That condo sold two weeks later for 82 and now recently sold again for 134. And it's like, wow, like we nickel and dime four grand and missed out on almost 70 grand in profit in three months. I mean, in three years, three months would have been amazing, three years. So it's like, sometimes it is tough. And I say that just for people listening who might've had these other experiences, but I think you've done such a great job of like outlining that there is gonna be some tough times, but if you persevere and keep going, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And this is an amazing path to financial freedom. So I want to kind of move the conversation over to your podcast, Twitter, how those things have helped you in your real estate journey and what your plans are for them going forward. Nice. Yeah, I have a friend who has a couple of apartments uh, near Shans that he uh, he short term rents. So that is a good area. But what I, I just want to respond to that really quickly. Oh, God, I wish I bought in Gainesville like five different <laughs> times. I wish my parents bought when I was there and then I tried to convince them to buy my, right now while my sister goes to school. <laughs> there and haven't haven't been able to make it happen. But what I was just going to say about that is in everything you do in real estate and the mistakes you make, it's all tuition on life and you learn. And yeah. was that a little bit of an expensive lesson? Sure. But yeah. there's really no, there's like, just forgive yourself. I mean, at least you tried. Do you know how many people yep. have never made an offer on something? Right? Yeah, you we, know, were, you, we were right there. 22. We were both 22. And yeah, we were both 22. We, our check was in escrow. We had our check mm-hmm. written out. We had a family member who was going to give us a cash off, a cash check to go out and buy it cash. We were right there. Um, but like you said, we learned so much like and now I'm not hesitant to go out and keep looking when the time is right. Obviously, priority now is getting a home for me and my significant other. But when the time is right, now I already know so much from that little experience. So I think that's a great call out like go out and take the risk. Even if it doesn't go through, go educate yourself, learn, see it. It's something that is going to be really beneficial for you down the road. Yeah. And, and be go easy on yourself. Give yourself some grace. <laughs> I mean, there's enough people out there speaking Speaking of Twitter, that will not be nice to you. So you might as well be nice <laughs> to yourself. Um, so I've, I've started the Adulting is Easy podcast as a way to sort of talk to my sister about personal finance. We are 13 years apart. So I'm 33. She is 20. And this started four years ago. So I would have been 29 and she would have been 16. And I had taught her everything. You know, I mean, I was there when she took her first steps, said her first words. I taught her to tie her shoes. I taught her to ride a bike. I took her to I took her to Florida when she went up there for college orientation. So of course, like, of course, all through her life, I'm teaching her. So of course, I'm going to teach her personal finance, right? So yep. that's how adulting is easy started. It started like that as like 20 something episodes of that, which was, you know, it's good. And those are still some of my favorite episodes in a way. Um, but then she got busy, you know, with SATs and applying for colleges and things like that. And it worked out because she got into Florida, but she didn't have the time for the actual podcast. Our, our conversations are mostly off mic now. So uh, it's I switched to interviewing um, personal finance experts. And like you said at the beginning, I knew that the listeners were going to learn something. I knew that that I was going to learn something. I didn't know how much I was going to love the networking aspect of it. And yep. I originally started the Twitter account at Adulting is Easy to grow the Adulting is Easy podcast. And then the Twitter kind of became this thing of its own. And so um, for a while, I was in this group. We did spaces once a week. And then I was in this other like Discord service for a while, which was fun. And then now I've I've met my business partners, Tom and Alan through Twitter. And we've met in person a couple of times. And we are starting this whole venture together. And so it's something that started, it, it's kind of like what I was saying about the real estate investing earlier. I didn't, you know, I, I set out kind of to do this podcasting thing and now it's expanded into so much more and we're creating some courses. We're going to be doing group coachings. Um, we're still going to be getting sponsors and things like that for the Adulting is Easy podcast, but also the, also the House Money podcast, which we launched the first episode um, in the middle of June, 2020. This, you know, the day after I left my nine to five job, uh, we launched 
launched the podcast. And so it's it's been a crazy fun journey. The internet can be a really not fun place if you let it. But if you look for the good and you look for the networking and you learn, are you there to learn and meet people? It can do a lot of good for you. And I and it's like what I was saying also about the real estate, like take action, do something, get on Twitter, message somebody, start a podcast. You're going to learn. I mean, even if, I mean, even if nothing financial comes out of it, I mean, the Adult Things Easy podcast makes some money. My Twitter account makes some money. House Money Media is making some money. But, you know, it's all part of the journey. And I don't know exactly where we're headed, but I don't think I've ever been, you know, more stoked about about the future. Yeah. And and I think that's great to say, like, take that leap of faith in Twitter or any social media platform. We have these amazing tools at our disposal. That hits home for me. I was a consumer of Twitter for a long time. And when I started my first companies in college, I had a lot of traction and I had a lot of attention on me, but I never leveraged social media the way I should have. And I do regret that now. So I try and always tell people when I have people like yourself on the show, like these are perfect examples of reasons why you should be leveraging social media just because you are, you're going to learn. And then what you said about uh, the podcast, that the networking was the kind of pleasant surprise that came from it. My whole thing is I started this podcast with no financial goals in mind. I love my job. It's a great job. This was a way for me to disconnect and do something fun after work. Um, I love building. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So this was my way to continue on with that and it not be like extremely stressful, like running an actual company. But my whole thing is I think podcasting is networking at scale. I'm able to do, I'm able to interact and network, which is normal. If you met somebody at a happy hour or something like that, you'd network. But now we were able to network, meet, build a relationship going forward and create a bunch of content from it to continue to grow that story and not benefit myself, but benefit you as well. So it just became such an attraction active way to kind of go and, and, and continue to build my network because that's what I enjoy. I love talking to people. I mean, wouldn't be in sales if that was the case. Um, I love to just talk to people and, and meet everybody. So I couldn't agree more with you on like what the hidden gem of podcasting really is. And that is growing your network and getting to talk and interview people that you might have not been able to naturally have a conversation with. So I just needed to call both of those things out because it was great. What are I guess like what are the next plans with the money media? Like what are you guys doing? What are you kind of pushing towards so our offering our main offering and what we want to do is launch first generation real estate investors so people who haven't seen it really one-on-one in their family maybe don't have friends that are doing it but want to learn and want to grow and want to basically change the trajectory of of where their family is heading i'm not going to throw the term generational wealth out there (laughs) because i don't think you have to be that ambitious you can do what i did right buy one place get rid of that mortgage and change your life so we are launching first generation real estate investors through our courses our podcast and our newsletter So those are the main things. The podcast and newsletter are obviously free. We're also going to have a Discord service that is going to be a a monthly fee. And then the courses as well. So for people who are very, very motivated, we're going to have long-term rental, short-term rental, long-distance investing courses that people can purchase. And then that will get us, me, Tom, and Alan for group coaching sessions to help analyze deals and really help people. So um, we we feel like we can can meet people, whether they like to read, whether they like to listen, or whether they want to actually get the real hands-on experience in terms of the courses. And and we fought it for a long time. We were like, nope, we're not going to be those people that have courses, you know, but we basically have gotten to the point where we can no longer mentor one-on-one. We just don't have the time. And we felt like this was the best way to help the most amount of people, really. That's awesome. And I'm looking forward to seeing that from you all. Again, like I said, that stuff is going to be linked um, under the description of the video so you guys can go interact and go utilize this amazing, like if you've listened to this episode, if you've gotten this far with us, there's been so many nuggets of amazing information. And and that's really why I do it. I I want people who are listening to be able to learn continuously new skills, new areas, new ways to better yourself. This is the first real estate conversation we're going to have on the virtual ventures. So I'm very excited about that. Um, And then a question that I always like to ask on my shows as a way to kind of take us to the end of the episode is, Lauren, what are you excited about in the near future for yourself? I am excited to be on a real estate content creation panel at FinCon. And so awesome. I, I went to FinCon last year, got to join some of these sessions, and I am beyond excited. Uh, Tom and Alan from House Money Media, Crystal, who's from Stacking Deeds, and our friend James from Rethink the Rat Race are all going to be doing a panel about content creation for real estate investors. And we don't quite have it all written out yet. Really excited for that. And that's in October. That's in New Orleans, which is one of my favorite cities. 
movies. And so I'm, I'm really excited for that. Not getting ahead of myself, though. I got a few months between now and then, um, but definitely looking forward to it. That's amazing. And, and I'm so excited. And I know you're going to crush it. I know you all are going to crush it. So I'm really excited to hear about it, see about it. So so that's amazing. Lauren, thank you so much for coming on the show. Like It has been an absolute pleasure. This was a very selfish episode for me. So many great nuggets of real estate, so much stuff that I get to go back now and do some homework on my own. I know that all of your information is going to be listed at the bottom of the episode, but I do have to cater to the lazy people who don't go and click the description that we take time and beautifully write. So what where can they find you? I know you mentioned at the beginning of the video, but where can they find you? Where are you most active? Any of that good stuff before we wrap up? What I would love is if people would follow me on Twitter at Adulting is Easy. Please follow House Money Media as well at Adulting is Easy and subscribe to the Adulting is Easy podcast as well. If you're listening to this, you'll probably like my podcast as well. Awesome. Again, Lauren, absolute pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for coming on the show and I look forward to staying in contact. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Andres.